RevOps tends to lean towards a unifying experience of your operations teams. So a lot of companies have marketing operations reporting to marketing, sales ops reporting to sales. And if you're lucky, you have a support or a CX operations team supporting your customer experience organization. And the question then is, do you unify all of that under one leader or one you know, org, is, org chart? And there's a couple of pros and cons to it, like anything. It's never a, a silver bullet. Revamp. I'm your host, Mark Lerner. Uh, really excited to have uh, my friend uh, Jeff with us today. Um, Jeff and I have had, uh, you know, we've talked a lot on on Zoom over the last few years. Uh, I think I came across Jeff from, you know, his um, activity in some of the communities we're both in, as well as some of his content. And we've had the opportunity to just chat and I really find him to be a valuable resource. So I'm really looking forward to it. Jeff, I'd love for you to kind of kick things off by giving us some background about who you are and what you do and where you come from. Hey, Mark, always, a, always a pleasure to just get a chance to talk to you, meet you in person as always. I think you and I've operated at different levels, right? Professional friendship over the last couple of years. So I really appreciate you and all that you do. Uh, name's Jeff Nasio. I lead growth and revenue operations at Regrow Ag. We're a technology focused company on tracking changes on farm for your scope three emissions so that companies can meet their 2030 targets to decarbonizing the world. I've been in revenue operations for roughly about 10 years now. I develop a bunch of content for revenue operators in the form of courses with the RevOps co-op. So sales ops course, a RevOps course, they have, we do that every quarter. Also the Rev Engine newsletter, RevOps Impact, uh, I call it ROI. So how can you get the ROI out of RevOps, RevOps Impact? And that's out of our Substack newsletter. And then I also run a podcast myself uh, with Cognizant, and it's called the RevOps Review. Yeah, that's, that's a lot. I actually, I'm looking at the newsletter right now, and I did not put together that acronym as being ROI. So that's clever. I love a good, clever uh, acronym. Um, yeah, you know, you're very prolific in kind of helping revenue operators kind of out in the ecosystem. Um, I think... It's been fun to watch because the space has been so dynamic and changing. Um, you know, I th back even only a few years ago, the title RevOps was sort of niche, you know? I mean, it was like people had these sales ops and marketing ops. Um, now, I think, you know, last year it was like the most sought after job role on LinkedIn or something along those lines. Um, so I'm interested, I think, kind of from your perspective, how have, how has this role of RevOps and the people that you interact with when you're doing some of your courses, how has that changed over the last few years? And what do you think kind of the, the reasoning behind those changes are? So I think you see a couple of things, right? The, the term revenue operations doesn't yet exist in a lot of different companies. It might have also a different naming convention. So go to market operations. I actually think that's a better word for it, but RevOps is the label that's kind of stuck. It's catchier because revenue is a lagging indicator at the end of the day. And go to market is a predictive action that we all take collectively as a group in order to meet our customers and meet with prospects. But RevOps is what's stuck. And I think the major changes that we've seen are a couple of things. RevOps tends to lean towards a unifying experience of your operations teams. So a lot of companies have marketing operations reporting to marketing, sales ops reporting to sales. And if you're lucky, you have a support or a CX operations team supporting your customer experience organization. And the question then is, do you unify all of that under one leader or one you know, org, is, org chart? And there's a couple of pros and cons to it, like anything. It's never a, a silver bullet. And so you can unify the company, uh, the company's organizational like operation resources under one banner. And what that would do is you basically create, hopefully, more alignment, upstream, downstream impact on processes and systems would be cleared and discussed right away. But you also now introduce a layer of ticketing and request through a central revenue operations leader. And so there are some organizations who experiment with kind of a hybrid org format where you basically have a business partnering function of your CX operations person interfacing with CS, but still reporting to RevOps. So now you could feel like you have two bosses instead of one if you are that CS operations person. 
Another format is to operate at the higher level with you know spending more time with a CRO and still having functional operations. That gives you some flexibility with speed to deployment for a lot of your projects that you might be thinking of, as well as your operating cadences and reporting. So I think a lot has changed. Um, and let's be frank, this started out in B2B SaaS. Um, so you know th that's the one sector that's been hurt quite badly uh, with the kind of the economic environment. Other industries probably are still growing or are doing fine, shielded from what's happening in the, uh, the, the B2B SaaS space. And I see some companies that are outside of SaaS starting to look at revenue operations as an org chart model uh, mm -hmm. for unifying all their org resources. So those are some changes that I'm seeing. And I, I personally think this will be an ongoing thing for the foreseeable future. Yeah, I agree. And it's interesting to hear from you know that perspective. One, Some of the things that stuck out in your how you were kind of talking about the evolution, you know, silos, alignment, those are kind of the, the keywords, right? It's this idea of instead of people working independently in all of these roles that all touch kind of this end goal of, of revenue, as you said, it's a lagging indicator, but that touch the go-to-market motion um, instead of having them kind of exist separately, um, to combine them into some sort of well-oiled unified machine, which I think has been might have been an ideal previously, but it possible that it, the, the technology to kind of support that, which wasn't there. Um, but you know, do you think that the you know how quickly we, everyone had to kind of figure out how to do work from home and go remote and support all of these remote tools in the sales process. Do you think that was like a forcing function to really kind of move RevOps into a more marquee role than it was previously? Do you think COVID kind of benefited for, for RevOps? Uh, you know, I'm not quite sure. I, I have a different theory of why yeah. revenue operations came into vogue. And so we think we go back to the history of all these tooling, right? We went from on-prem to cloud-based software. And so you can mm -hmm. miniaturize different point solutions for different functions, different groups within the business. And so now you can build these specific point tools within the org, sales tools, marketing tools, CS tools, move it onto the cloud. And you actually can shift the resourcing to administer and design these tools away from business systems and IT to the functions themselves. So then sales, marketing, and CS had to look for resources that could really match their business processes and flesh it out into these systems, and hence the role of the systems administrator. And so now you have these you know, technical resources who are also go-to-market minded. Quite frankly, a lot of go-to-market folks who dabble in these tools end up becoming administrators unto themselves. And then eventually you, you create um, a kind of a cacophony of different folks in silos and companies themselves wanted a unified leadership. So the chief revenue officer became a role that was kind of growing in fashion first. And then the revenue operations leader kind of was a fast follow onto the CRO. So you needed to bring in a COO to the revenue, to the chief revenue officer, and that COO to the CRO was the RevOps leader. And so that's why you were able to see certain businesses unify you know, their end-to-end -end customer experience by bringing it under one leader. But then to make their vision reality, you had to bring in, you know, that RevOps leader. So I think that's what that's what pushed it. Uh, COVID changed the business landscape tremendously, right? We moved to working from home. You saw a rise of digital tools. You saw the outside sales model turning into an inside sales model. So folks who were selling to the enterprise, accustomed to traveling and meeting clients in person, had to do all that work, you know, in uh, virtually. And so you had the rise of these cloud-based tool, cloud tools, sales automation, so uh, outreach, the sales loss of the world. Then you start looking at um, you know, better demo tools, better, better product onboarding tools. And so it really created an opportunity for folks to create a better working from home selling experience because quite frankly, a lot of businesses were used to selling in person or over the phone. Uh, uh, the reality of this also, there, you know, it's not all just pros, right? The cons. People don't pick up their phone anymore because you're, they're not at the office. There's no office phone. And so, and people don't want to pick up their mobile phone because they're like spam likely, or I don't know who this person is. Just not going to pick it up. And then you also see um, emails, like everyone's inboxes are a disaster now because we couldn't reach you with phone calling. So we're going to try emailing you. So now you're getting blown up 
on your email. And then I'm now seeing companies SMS me, hit me up via text. So, you know, one channel gets shut down, another just expands in terms of the spam. And so I am seeing, you know, COVID really transformed um, how we go to market. Yeah. Uh, I'm actually, this is kind of a non sequitur, but are you an inbox zero kind of guy or is your inbox no. just a total disaster? Yeah, I can't go to sleep at night unless there's zero. In my, like, it'll keep me up. So, like, I am militantly inbox zero to the point where I miss a whole bunch of emails because I just <laughs> have to not have them. You know, um, I can't see that number. Like, people who have like, they'll show me their phone and it says like three thousand unread. I'm like, how do you survive? I'm um, not a zero. I'm not a zero inbox guy. I'm a I'm an inbox hundred guy. So I'll probably have like a hundred unopened emails. I try not to let them age out too long. Um, I will get to them. But quite frankly, most of the emails that come in my inbox are not top priority. Like there are very few things that are top priority. And uh, most of the time it's a shoulder tap via Slack or a meeting on my calendar. That, and, and, I, and I actually uh, uh, say, yes, to, I'm going to join that meeting. That is what is probably top priority. Yeah, I mean, there is a lot of noise. And usually around holidays uh, is when I have the opportunity to unsubscribe to all, from all the junk that I've been subscribed to because I get all those emails. Um, but kind of back to, um, you know, what we were talking about, um, I think the, I, you know, I, I, your, your hypothesis about RevOps being a fast follow from the idea uh, the, the CRO role, I think is super interesting and one I hadn't quite thought through a bit, but it, it makes sense because that is the, organizationally, that is the, you know, the, the shifting of the mindset from having a chief sales officer and a chief whatever, a chief revenue officer is kind of over the entire revenue uh, organization. And that person needs, you know, their general in the, in the field. So that makes a lot of sense. I want to shift, um, you know, we talked about kind of the things that have happened so far. Um, you know, right now we're in early December of 2023. Um, so 2024 is, you know, just around the corner. Um, obviously, it feels like every year for the last three or four years has been a decade. So much has changed, right? And it's been so hard to foresee some of these changes. Like who could have really foreseen COVID or, you know, the things that happened as a result. Um, but let's, you know, we can try to put on our profit P-R-O-P-H-E-T hat um, and look at, look into the future over the next 12 months. Um you know, how do you think uh, someone in a RevOps role, um, how do you think the expectations on that role will kind of shift and evolve and change over the course of the next 12 months? So in 2024, I think you'll see, you know, we, we follow a lot of the macro trends and the macro trends take time for its way to work its way through the economy. And what we've seen in the last three or four years, if you've been in the startup world, Every year, like you said, has felt like a decade. We've had to, you know, tap dance and dodge a lot of different challenges out there. COVID, uh, the end of ZERP, zero interest rate policies, uh, and then now you're seeing probably a repricing um, as a, a multiple assets and businesses that are out there. Uh, I was just looking at a couple of LinkedIn posts talking about net recurring revenue. And in the sales tech space, Zoom Info was kind of a, a big, uh, a big story, and you can see that their their NRR was north of, uh, sub, south of ninety percent, meaning uh, yeah. that you know their their ending ARR MRR plus expansion minus churn should technically be over a dollar. That's how you grow in a subscription based business. But it, now that they're under ninety cents, you're actually seeing probably you know competitive er erosion in terms of pricing in their core segments. And then also customers are either uh, not renewing, going out of business, or they're downgrading. And, and you're, you're quite frankly seeing that in a lot of B2B SaaS because the number one customer, if you look at you know the industry flag within a lot of these customers, uh, companies, you'll find that they're selling to other B2B SaaS companies. So you're seeing this like shrinkage um, of the entire space. So where do I think it's going to change? And I think we have to be very specific around you know which segments of the market. If we're talking about startups, I think you're going to have to operate with a do more with less uh, environment. The headcount that you're requesting, you're not going to get all the headcount you're asking for. In fact, you might not get any headcount. So you're going to have to buckle up and think through, you know, what does duct tape and bubble gum look like? Well, you're probably going to have to operate with duct tape and bubble gum next year, right? Um, rather than buy, you're going to have to think about build. You know, building building options are going to be 
uh, prevalent. You should also plan for you know trying to build simple. Don't build complex. If you build simple, you're incurring less technical debt by definition, and you'll have to pay that back with very little fanfare down the road. But if you're going with a very complex solution, you could be finding yourself in a world of hurt in 2025, 2026, if the market shifts. Another thing we want to look for is the tooling. A lot of people have already rationalized a lot of their tooling. They've already dumped you know, 10, 20 points on their dollar that they spent for, for tech tooling. And a lot of folks have been shop, shopping for bundles. I expect that to continue. I expect renewals to also be, you know, you're gonna have to, every new renewal is going to be a conversation. It's not going to be an auto renewal. So if you're if you're in a RevOps role and you're working with your finance person, you should know exactly when you're going to renew on specific tools. You should be working backwards 60 to 90 days, having a conversation whether or not you're going to renew, double down or spend less. And I guess you're probably going to want the same product for less. You're also going to probably want to negotiate your payment terms. You're probably, instead of paying annual upfront, you're probably going to play hardball and go quarterly, monthly. It's just this is the way the game is played because now we have new mandates to preserve cash and increase our cash flow. Um, other areas where I think, you know, I, I personally don't think revenue operators are going to get a lot of help in terms of learning and development from their teams, especially at the startups. So I expect your working hours probably to tick up a little bit. And so what I would say is invest the time, especially during the holiday season, during December, when times are a little bit slow, go learn something new, go learn a new skill. That skill, hopefully, on the back end is going to save you some time. Learn how to automate something. Right? The first time I ever learned how to automate something was reading Automate the Boring Stuff. It's a Python book, and I learned how to use automation to quickly um, you know, shave time off my day. Also, uh, leverage the AI tools that are out there. I think they're super powerful. Um, folks get stuck on a lot of things, and I think you know, the, the old way was, was you know, try to hammer away at it all, all night. Second way was looking it up on YouTube or Stack Overflow. The third was you know going to communities and hopefully someone was generous enough to give you the answer. And the fourth is now using these AI tools. I think they're they're pretty powerful to helping you become you know a four x five x operator. Um, that's what I expect for next year. Um, I I don't think it's going to be a rosy picture. I think it is you're going to do more with less. You're not going to get your head count. It's going to be a, a build versus buy year, and you're going to have to invest in yourself and 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 you know you know pick yourself up from the bootstraps. Yeah. So a very uh, not not much light at the end of the tunnel on the macro um, picture. Yeah, uh, a bit of sombering. <laughs> Sorry. Yeah, I actually I've heard that a lot, but I'm I'm to me that makes me more bullish. If the market is negative, then any sort of positive sentiment that pops up it has a greater impact. But that's more of a, an investor mentality. Invest in yeah. yourself. If investors are investing in the business, invest in yourself. Is what I say. Totally yeah. on board with that. You know, you so you were you approached. You were approaching that from the perspective of the revenue operator in within their organization in terms of what they can expect in terms of resources and expectations upon themselves uh, in terms of making more with less. Uh, kind of, you know, looking at the larger picture and multiplying that across all the customers, right? So that's going to happen in every B2B SaaS, meaning that the company that this person works at is going to be suffering from having their customers being told they have to cut their budgets and have less resources. Uh, and what I, you know, what that says to me is that, fo you know, being able to help operationalize the renewal process, the upsell and opportunity, you know, um, taking advantage of those opportunities and finding those opportunities, kind of operationalizing and facilitating that for the internal team is going to, be a more important task. Um, is that something that you're seeing RevOps folks put effort towards today? Enough effort? Is it something that it seems like, you know, the net new uh, acquired customer tends to get the, you know, lion's share, but is that, you know, existing customer expansion opportunity getting enough attention from RevOps and will it require more? The answer is no. I would think that sales operations is primarily the first place where operations tends to invest. It's also, you know, there's a, a feeling that RevOps is just sales ops in disguise or sales ops rebranded. You'll hear that quite a bit. And then, you know, we hear this all the time. I always post this, that CS operations is the underfunded like child in, in the house. They're the ones who don't get the allowance. And that's, that's totally fair um, and, and true in a lot of companies, right? You ask folks, What's the head? What's the first headcount you're going to hire? They're going to tell you, sales. Then the, 
when do you hire CS? Well, we hire when the customer gets here as opposed to, hey, let's hire, instead of just in time CSM hiring, why don't we hire the CSMs ahead of time? If, especially if you're going to bank on, you know, growth numbers from your existing book of business. But if we're shifting our attention to growth next year, you know, there's a couple of ways that I've seen this. And I've seen this at the go-to-market 2023 conference that Pavilion hosted. Insights partner was on stage. And Jeremy Donovan showed this chart where sales and marketing expense as a percentage of revenue has actually stayed flat year on year. So, you know, obviously you have, you know, an envelope that you're right sizing and you're trying to stay within that 40% range. Then, but the customer acquisition cost, the CAC, that's your total sales and marketing expense divided by the number of new customers that you're acquiring, that number has exploded. It's actually increased upwards up and to the right. And that's very dangerous. And what you the reason that is, is even though you're spending the same amount on sales and marketing, you're actually acquiring fewer customers. So your CAC is now increasing. And to pay yourself back over time, you're going to have to have either a lower churn rate. That means that you that the customer is with you for a number of more, more years or you're going to have to slap price increases on them over the long term. I think you can do both. But with the CSM, the focus is going to be, let's preserve and protect our current balance sheet with our current customers. Let's make sure that they're getting the value that they expected when they first signed up with us. And that if we find a path to expansion, we know early and can develop a play or a series of conversations with that prospect that's going to say, we're your partner for this specific space. We are not a nice to have. We are a need to have. And you cannot operate that well with, without us. And so what we'd like to do is make sure that we've locked you in for a couple of years and we co-solve whatever you're going through and finding that true value and then making sure that we're collecting you know, the right amount of value in terms of ARR or revenue with you, but just making it a, a shared conversation. So you know, I do think we're going to start shifting our resources as a business to looking at protection of that revenue, making sure that our, our net recurring revenue is over 100% and that we still try to bring in the growth. But the reality is if you average it out across this landscape, metrics don't look so rosy on new acquisition. Yeah, that is a scary thought. I, I hadn't seen that metric though. I kind of intuitively knew it was there, right? I mean, I think anyone that's in a company that has a view of pipelines and and kind of quarterly, um, you know, um, productivity and, and things like that kind of understands intuitively that those things are true. Um, so, you know, we're just about one year out from the introduction of ChatGPT to the masses in terms of like the actual chat interface. OpenAI had an API apparently for well before that, but most of us, at least myself, were didn't really know anything about it. And, I, you know, obviously that was a huge inflection point for everybody. The world changed. Um, and continues to change. Um, you know, there are a lot of people maybe scoff and say it's just a parlor trick. It can write, you know, maybe generic sounding content. Um, but from your perspective, you know, does this, you know, kind of democratizing of access to AI have, a, you know, are there ways in which RevOps can leverage that? And, you know, are there kind of low hanging fruit that isn't being utilized by some today? Oh, 100%. If you think about the, uh, I listened to the All In podcast and they published, they were talking about a study. I don't know the study myself, so this is secondhand knowledge, but they were showing that developer, the companies with software developers who were using uh, the GitHub Copilot versus, you know, companies who weren't using it, they found that the companies who were using the Copilot were 55% more productive. So there's this argument that's out there that you become a 10x developer, kind of like a mecha soldier, a mecha, a mecha soldier wearing like a suit of armor on top of you. I find that to be true even with revenue operations, right? So if we're thinking about the system administration layer, if we're thinking at the SQL data warehousing, data visualization layer, like for example, I run the executive dashboard at my company reporting on finance metrics, and we're doing a bunch of time series and cross joins uh, in that. One thing that I'm doing is I write the query myself and it damn near came to about 130 lines of code. And guess what? I tried to run it. It wouldn't run. There are some sort of errors. The compiler error is the compiler is telling me where the issue is, but doesn't tell me how to fix it. And so I'm going into chat GPT and I'm saying, Hey, can you fix this piece of code that I wrote? Comes back to me and says, yeah, not only here's the issue, but here's how I can shrink your code by 30 lines. I'm like, mm -hmm. Oh my goodness. All right. So it showed me a new, like a new tip, a new way of make, becoming more productive. So do I think we can reach 55% gains like the software developers are? I think so. I think we could probably crush that. I think we'll have better gains. What that means for businesses is you can operate with fewer resources. Um, and, and I know people are talking about AI is coming for our jobs. It probably is. 
So let's be real. ChatGPT is an AI, these, these different models. I know they're LLMs. They tend to hallucinate um, and, and become wrong. But at some point, that solution, that problem is going to be solved, right? You're going to pair a discrete model on top of these LLMs, and you're going to bake in these capabilities all across all of our tooling at different areas. And it's just going to make you 55% more productive at the minimum. Yeah, I think, it. you know, um, I don't know if it was Steve Jobs uh, or he's the one who's kind of credited with it or maybe it was um, someone else, Bill Gates, someone like that, um, said that, you know, when good software or a good product really works, it's akin to the feeling you have when you experience magic, right? Um, and that's the initial reaction I had to ChatGPT and the reaction I often have with it. Um, but I agree with you. I think it's kind of democratized a certain level of uh, knowledge around developing and coding that, you know, even if you had some knowledge there there was always kind of a little gap and you would need to kind of like you said go into a community or stack overflow or ask a coworker, and that was always you know a friction point and now those of us who aren't kind of uh educated and in, uh, in that world are able to kind of bridge that gap and and and, and do things independently and, and i'm i have very little background in code and, and i've been able to kind of do some of those automating um things myself um, and really kind of scale that up from, you know, little internal projects to company-wide, uh, you know, workflows and automation. So I agree with you. Um, so I guess as, you know, we're, as we wrap this up, um, I kind of want to, you know, let's say that we're, you know, December, December 6th, 2024, we have, uh, we have our follow-up of this episode. We, you know, Jeff Ignacio 2.0, um, how do you think? some of the projections we talked about you, the how do you think we'll look back on this conversation will it be like oh that was cute and naive or do you think we'll be you know it'll <laughs> yeah predictions are always meant to be wrong i always feel like um yeah but let's let's play this out a little bit um people don't know this about me but i studied economics in undergrad so i've always been enamored by macro and then um how that plays out the system is always a wild unknown um yeah. but i per i personally think um you know as a country um we're probably, uh, people are talking about soft landing and um, people were thinking about that where we're going to land without a recession. Um, but the, the, the um, folks are now guessing that we probably are seeing signs of weakness at, in the consumer. Uh, we saw weakness in the enterprise, the B2B, and now it's moving into the consumer space. Credit card utilizations are at all time high, et cetera, et cetera. Um, federal, federal student payments are coming back. Um, so what does that mean? Um, if we go through a recession, um, you'll probably see the Fed cut rates. Uh, that'll be good because cost of capital uh, will be lower. And in venture-backed businesses, that's always a good sign. Um, does that mean that we're going to turn the money spot on? No, I don't think so. Um, but I think you've had a number of different revenue operators out there who've gone through four years of hell uh, with COVID, with ZERP, and then now the maybe a hard landing. Um, you'll probably see some battle-tested veterans out of the revenue operations space. I think whoever grabs these 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 names, these people are going to be valuable. Uh, are going to have some extreme value from these operators. So what I'd like to see is probably some of these folks in B two B SaaS that are unemployed right now, and I know quite a few people have been posting. I want to see them remove those green banners on LinkedIn, get great jobs, and be the operators that uh, that are probably ten x more valuable because they've gone through some tough times. They have tools like ChatGPT to help them. Um, and so I think a year from now, uh, we'll probably tee us up for a great 2025. Awesome. That was, uh, I really appreciate your time today, Jeff, and, uh, looking forward to checking in again soon. Awesome. That was